In May 1999, cinema's most stalwart time traveller was reported to have landed in London, and the signs of Chris Marker's presence were too numerous for it not to be so. An installation work on show at Beaconsfield Gallery, the arrival in London of American director Michael Schamberg, whose film Souvenir features computer graphics by Marker, and a newspaper article posed a direct question to further jog memories recently refreshed by Terry Gilliam's Twelve Monkeys, a big-budget remake of Marker's 1962 new wave classic, La Gité. But Marker is famously retiring, so no question of an interview. However, a telltale signature had been left in the gallery's visitor's book. The time traveller had arrived incognito, signing in at his own show in the cartoon guise of his favourite cat, William of Egypt. Short Attention Span Cinema presents a snapshot of the work of Chris Marker. But first, we asked American director Michael Schamberg to describe it for us. Is it a documentary or is it a narrative? Is it an essay? Is it, you know, an, a piece of art? There, I mean, it is everything. And that's what makes it so wonderful. A peacetime morning. A peacetime bedroom. A real bedroom. Real children. Real birds. Real cats. Real graves. There must be a direct influence it's, um, because his work has been so important to me. And yes, it does deal a lot with memory, and I do find that people uh, who speak to me after seeing the film do ask me about Marker and if I knew his work. And do you want to see me again? I see you now, and you see me. Where will I go? You are always leaving. I want you to stay. I am staying. You're holding me inside you. I'm not telling you to stop. But we have to interrupt this. I am afraid. It took a long time for this to happen. It seems like it began so long ago. This is poetry. I want Mother to write again. About us? About what we stand for. How will she know? When I tell her that our love is cast. That her love will last. When I decided to, to use a computer, I wanted to make the computer as um, low-tech as possible and sort of remember, five years ago even, the computer was not as familiar to the masses as it is today. And um, it was still a thing of whatever, uh, something foreign and something high-tech, etc. So I was trying to take something to make it more familiar, sort of break it down, and, and it was a character in my film. But I didn't want to use um, uh, typical electronic voices, for example. So the voice of the computer is an actress, a deaf actress. Um, and then when it came to the imagery, I wanted it to, to be very, very simple, almost childlike. And Chris was doing that on Apple IIGS at the time. And um, so I asked if he would create these uh, graphics for me, and of course he did. Marker's recently completed CD-ROM, In Memory, is a personal archive of the filmmaker's 40-year career that gives some vital clues to his background as an inveterate globetrotter. In the 1950s, Marker was a photographer and writer, publishing commentaries on his travels. One such document, Korean, Women of Korea, was an interplay of stills and text was the seed for La Jetée sown in such books. La Jetée tells the story of a soldier who is used as a guinea pig in time travel experiments in post-apocalypse Paris. The film's combination of frozen moments of time and voiceover commentary conceals as many layers and is as open to as many interpretations as memory itself. It works because it's so technically brilliant. I mean, it works on a, a musical level. It's like we're listening to music in that one. It's, it's, the images are coming up, and the editing is the most extraordinary editing I've ever seen because it's a rhythm he's setting up, and the voice, the voice, the narrator's voice. It's, you're just, I mean, you're dealing with poetry at this point. They walk. They look at the trunk of a sequoia tree covered with historical dates. She pronounces an English name he doesn't understand. As in a dream, 
He shows her a point beyond the tree, hears himself say, this is where I come from. and falls back exhausted. The English name that the time traveler doesn't recognize can only be one name, Hitchcock. And Le Jeté is haunted by the spirit of Hitchcock's 1958 film, Vertigo. The time traveler points to the rings on the trunk of an ancient tree with the same gesture that Kim Novak's Madeline used to show James Stewart the points in time when she lived and when she died. She sleeps in the sun. He knows that in this world, where he has just landed again for a little while, in order to be sent back to her, she is dead. I've never seen La Jete in English. I've only seen it in French, and my French is appalling. It didn't matter. I could tell what the story was. Now, that's an intriguing thing, to, to use um, stills, not use the conventional techniques of cinema to tell a story, and yet he's doing it and we get it because the images are the, are the right images. We can understand the images even if we don't understand what is being said. But you know what's being said because of the images. It's quite extraordinary how he does it. I, it's, it's a wonderful juggling act is what it is, but, I, but ultimately it works because it's a piece of poetry and music. La Jete is also the name of a Tokyo theme bar. The La Jete bar in Tokyo is one of the things of which I'm proudest, runs Marker's text. To think that for 30 years, Japanese cinephiles came every night to drink, often more than reason demands, beneath images from this film. The bar in Tokyo reciprocates Marker's long fascination with Japan. In 1982, Marker made Sans Soleil, a film that voyaged between what he called the twin poles of survival, Guinea-Bissau in the Cape Verde Islands, and Tokyo. Again, a fictional time traveler narrated the journey. Around the same period, Marker went on location to the slopes of Mount Fuji with the legendary director Akira Kurosawa to shoot AK, a film on the making of Ran, Kurosawa's epic adaptation of King Lear. And at the center of that system, Sensei. We too got into the habit of calling him Sensei, Master. In all disciplines, from flower arrangement to karate, the Sensei is he who, by achieving technical perfection, has got a sort of spiritual bonus out of it. The aura of respect that surrounds and protects Kurosawa is nothing like the reign of terror that some lesser directors impose on the set. And just like the great sword masters of the past, Sensei has no time for abstraction. When he speaks of his work, he reflects on factual experiences. When asked why he did this or that, he says, I simply make a film as I want it to be. I don't know anyone who works as hard and as much as he does, is as committed to the work that he is and also to very political and very concerned with the, the human condition. Um, but as a tremendous sense of humor and uh, and so as a person, you, I mean, he's extremely warm and, and um, a lot of fun to be with. Um, and I think he can maintain that simply by, by not getting involved with the public in that way and being fortunate enough to be able to, to just work and be concerned with that.